Am I coming through the speakers well enough? I'm on the edge of losing my voice because I've had lots of wonderful conversations today. So if I start trailing off, anyone can yell and say, please speak louder. Um, but thank you, Julie. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to all the grad students uh, who I was able to talk to this afternoon. It was a really great time. And if that happens for too long, someone tell me, um, please. The research I'm going to present today, um, the first part of it is in collaboration with uh, Chris Elphick, as Julie mentioned, at University of Connecticut, and I'm going to talk more about what I've been working on at Succinct. I'd like to thank all of the funders um, for this work, especially the field work and some of the survey data you'll see, and, and a lot of the private landowners let us work on their land. Uh-oh. Um, so there's been this recent shift from thinking of conservation as a sub-discipline of natural sciences or something that's derived from the natural sciences to something that's a little bit more interdisciplinary where conservation is a problem-based, crisis-driven discipline that's informed by lots of other disciplines, which makes it a little bit harder to know what you need to know to do good conservation. And this is a question that kind of informs all of my research as kind of an overarching frame, is better understanding what types of knowledge we need to make good conservation decisions. So if this graph shows, if the, the bigness of the arrow is how important a certain discipline is to conservation, this is kind of how I would draw it after I left uh, working for Audubon for a few years. Um, yeah, where a, a lot of the emphasis is not on natural sciences, but of course this is really context dependent. I was doing a lot of policy and land protection work. If you're doing restoration ecology, maybe it would look something more like this. And I'm really interested in developing ways where we can actually do research to figure out what types of knowledge should we use to deform, um, inform uh, curricula for graduate programs, for forming interdisciplinary teams, and just in general making better conservation decisions. You think I have a loose connection maybe? Maybe if I put this up here so it's not hanging down anymore. No, I made it go away forever. We could just go... Um, it looks like it's on pretty tight though, doesn't it? So now I really helped. <laughs> Maybe we just do a clean cut and put it back on. Oh, oh, don't touch it. Okay, I'm gonna screw in the little things. I feel like we're doing better now. All right, thank you. I won't try to <laughs> So today I'm going to talk about estimating extinction risk and what we need to know to get a good estimate of extinction risk that we feel good about. And I'm going to be doing that uh, for tidal marsh species. Tidal marshes are found around the world, but since half of the world's population lives in coastal areas, it's hard to find a tidal marsh without some kind of human influence nearby. And this is just an example from Boston, um, where there's lots of private landowners right adjacent to marshes. The East Coast of North America contains one third of the world's tidal marshes, and it has the highest degree of tidal marsh endemism of anywhere in the world. And as Julie said, one of these endemic species is the salt marsh sparrow. Um, so this species is a, is a pretty weird and mysterious species. It's the only bird in the world that spends its entire life cycle in tidal marshes. Has anyone heard of the species that's not in a Lockwood lab before today? Well, it's right in your backyard. Um, one of the things that we do know about this species is their entire global breeding range is sandwiched between the sea and one of the most densely populated regions on the planet. Um, and so a lot of my research takes place in Long Island Sound, which is the core of their range. Um, there's a lot we don't know about this species. There's some things we don't know, and a lot of things we do know are pretty weird, like they're the most promiscuous bird in the world. Um, Females take care of the young and males don't do anything at all. Um, and the other thing we know is that their life cycle is tied pretty tightly to high tides. So there's a really strong relationship between offspring survival and the height of a tide. And that's because flooding is a direct cause of mortality in the species. This is a nest being washed away during a high tide in a salt marsh. This was one of the the motivating factors for this multi-university collaboration that started a few years ago, there's clearly a potential risk here to salt marsh species like salt marsh sparrows. Um, and this is called the Salt Marsh Habitat and Avian Research Program, or SHARP. I worked, uh, uh, I had a small role on this project as a grad student, um, and I'm gonna not talk too much about what I've done 
um, with this collaboration, except to say that I think I'll, I'll boil it down to this one posterior distribution, which is, oh no. Um, the, this is the global growth rate for salt marsh sparrows across their range when it comes back up. Um, so the, the height of the bars shows how likely the growth rates along the x-axis are. <laughs> I'm, there's not like too many graphs. I feel like it's turning off anytime the graph shows up. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So when it comes back on, look at that most of this is actually negative. Um, so there, there, it's, but there's a lot of uncertainty. And this was estimated using just demographic data, so vital rates, survival, and reproduction. If we compare this to other work that Sharp has done, which is um, survey data, it matches up pretty well, and they have a lot less uncertainty on their side of things. So we can tell from this that salt marsh sparrows are declining across their range, and if we just project this into the future, 9% per year given their starting population size now, we predict they go extinct in 2076. Um, but there's a couple assumptions that we'd have to make to do this, which is that vital rates, it's getting much worse. I feel like this is not sustainable. Uh, I'm using the thick, thicker one. I might have solved it by putting this up here. I think I did. All right. <laughs> Nobody look at it too hard. <laughs> okay, I think we're good now. I think as long as that stays up there and I don't touch the computer, only touch this. Um, so. We could project this in the future, but that assumes that survival and reproductive rates stay constant into the future, which is probably an unreasonable assumption because sea levels are rising. Um, so one reasonable thing we could do is take mean sea level and relate that to one of these vital rates and project that into the future like this. Um, but the, what this ignores is how much noise there is in, in sea level um, over time. And sea level actually varies by years, months, and hours, and decades as well. But um, there's a lot of variation here, which potentially could be really important because it's the height of tides that's a direct cause of mortality for salt marsh sparrows. So this is um, salt marsh sparrows nest in tidal marshes. They have to, oh. Okay, so you are using, you're using the VGA into, mm -hmm. do you have an HDMI converter at all? I don't have any adapters other than this one, no. Okay. Unless I can stick that. Oh, maybe I just have a port. Yeah, on that side. Simpler. It's um. Still flashing, huh? I feel like it's actually not me then. I'm not the problem. There it goes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure yet. This has been long enough. Um, so, so much for us to lay eggs, incubate those eggs, and rear chicks within 23 days. And so these dotted lines show high tides, um, or the height of high tides over the course of a lunar cycle. And at every full moon, we're going to get a big tide that's going to prevent them from um, making a nest. And so with just a little bit of sea level rise, we could potentially interrupt this nesting cycle. And once there's a little bit of sea level rise and they can no longer get eggs out, reproduction stops and the species goes extinct. So the, the height of high tides is potentially really important going into the future. Um, so we want to know how we, how we need to consider these tide events, but there are a couple challenges. One, since this is based on field data, nest visits happen every three to five days, which is... We got it. We got it. We went yeah, to we went to HDMI. Okay. I was, I was being a Luddite and making everything worse. No, we got okay. Great. Four, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that anyway. We can just skip that point. If you want to talk about statistical models later, I'm happy to talk about new statistical models. But the real challenge is, how do we project the height of tides far enough in the future to project salt marsh sparrow populations in the future when a single high tide event could actually be really important? 
Fortunately, where I work in Long Island Sound, the astronomical component of tide, so the, the part that's caused by the orbits of the sun and the moon, account for 95% of the variation in tide height. So the orbits of the sun and the moon are predictable with complete certainty. So that's a good, that's a good start. We've got 95% of the variation there already. And then we also just have this other 5%, which is caused by the meteorological component. So this is just some orbits of the sun and the moon. We put them all together. Um, there's actually 45 different components that we're using um, to predict the height of the astronomical component of tide from now until the end of the century. And then we take the tide station data from the, the nearest tide gauge, which gives us the overall tide height, which includes the meteorological component. So this is basically just wind pushing the water up onto the shore, which pushes up the tide a little bit. If we send these um, tidal constituent equations backwards in time, we can get the astronomical component for some past records and then subtract them from the overall tide gauge to get just that meteorological component or storm surge or sometimes called wind forcing. Then we take all of these uh, wind forcing data and we put them in a Bayesian hierarchical model which I'm happy to talk about later in more detail but the gist of it is we're accounting for a trend in storm surge over time, we're accounting for a seasonal variation in mean sea level and an hourly variation because high tides close to each other are correlated and then, then we can add all these components back together to predict tides into the future with some uncertainty. So we did this by fitting data from 1979 to 2011 and then we validated it using data from 2002 to 2014 and these data were not used to fit this, this model. And this is just going to prove to you that I, I think we did an okay job of predicting tides. Um, so on this graph here, we're looking at a prediction of mean sea level for every high tide during the salt marsh sparrow breeding season. The bars are our 95% prediction intervals. The dots are the observed high tides in 2014. So as you would expect, 95% of those dots are on these intervals. And so we are predicting into the future with some pretty good precision and accuracy the height of every high tide. Um, and there is some uncertainty here, of course, but we are going to propagate that, which I'll explain a little bit. So we're going to put all of these tide data into a bird population model. Um, so basically, we're going to follow the fate of every female in the salt marsh sparrow population through her nesting cycle. So there's nest building, incubation, and then at every high tide during that time, she faces a trial. And that the trial is whether or not the nest and the contents of the nest will survive that high tide. And we have the relationship between high tides and nesting to do that trial. Um, and if a female fails, she can re-nest. Um, with a certain probability. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of parameters that go into this model. It's a pretty um, big one, but this is the general idea. And we're going to do this for every female in the population and track her offspring um, in subsequent years and essentially just brute force simulate the salt marsh sparrow population, taking into account the fact that every 12 hours they face this trial of tides. Some of the key aspects of this model are that um, we're propagating uncertainty as much as possible, including from estimating parameters, but also that um, uncertainty in meteorological forcing that I showed earlier. So uh, any source of uncertainty that we think could be important is incorporated in this, so there's a lot of uncertainty in the model. One of the more interesting things that we found from this model was this threshold here. So this graph shows the proportion of 23 day uh, of breeding seasons that have a 23 day window in it that's good enough for salt marsh sparrow breeding. Um, and over time, you see we're kind of approaching this cliff where starting in uh, maybe 2050, 2055, there's no longer any breeding seasons that can support any salt marsh sparrow nesting. And it drops off pretty quick, so it, would, it might come before we really even see it. Of course, the species is going to go extinct long before reproduction completely stops. Um, so when we look at the results from the, the, the overall population model, we see that extinction is going to happen sometime between 2035 and 2055, according to these estimates. Um, this black bar is a 95% credible interval, and then there are the quantiles shown on it. Um, it does look like the population is going up at first, and that's because we have a few years of, of good tide timing coming up, but that's not going to last. So there's a few really important assumptions with this modeling. Um, I mean, every big model like this has a lot of assumptions, but these are the ones that I think are most important. First, hurricanes won't influence this population trajectory. Nesting habitat doesn't change, and marshes won't migrate inland. 
Um, and I, I think these are important because the profile of this species is being raised a little bit now that these results are kind of out in the world. Um, uh, they're being covered more in the popular press. Actually, just last week, the New York Times had a um, front page of the, the Tuesday Times was a salt marsh sparrow article um, with really great metaphors in it for, that I'm going <laughs> to steal. Um, but also, a lot of these extinction estimates are being used to, uh, in status assessments, and so they're being moved down the IUCN list. They were, earlier this year, moved from vulnerable to endangered. They're, uh, uh, candidate species for federal listing or they're being, they're being prepared as a candidate species for federal listing. And so I think that uh, these assumptions could be very important because they could have a pretty big estimate um, uh, effect on what extinction risk actually is and uh, the stakes are getting higher and higher um, for getting this right. Um, so the first assumption I want to talk about, so I'm going to talk about these assumptions and, and how obsessing over them has led to different research opportunities. Um, and, and I think we've also learned some stuff by obsessing over these assumptions that you would think have to do with just salt marsh sparrows but have turned out to have some broader implications. Um, the first is that hurricanes won't influence population trajectories. There's lots of sources of peak tide temporal variation. Peak tides can um, happen twice a day monthly and as well with stream storms like hurricanes. And our model that I just presented does account for two of these sources, but it doesn't account for hurricanes because hurricanes are really hard to model because they're extreme rare events. So we don't have enough data to look at trends. Um, we barely have enough data to predict how frequently a hurricane is going to hit the salt marsh barrel range. But it's potentially really important. This is Hurricane Sandy barreling towards the core of the salt marsh barrel range. Um, and and it was during this time when all the salt marsh sparrows were still there. So this is uh, a potentially a big source of mortality. So we are interested in this question, but since it's very hard to answer, we flipped it around. And instead of asking how should we model hurricanes, how huge of a demographic, dem demographic impact do we need to influence extinction risk? So how big would a hurricane have to be before it changes our understanding of what's happening to the salt marsh sparrow population trajectories? How we're kind of phrasing this question. So the way we're defining impact in the population trajectory is something that's outside the normal range of variation. So um, this graph here, all these blue lines are different projections of the salt marsh sparrow population. And this uncertainty comes from variation in vital rates. So annual variation in vital rates, not parameter uncertainty. And those dotted lines are the 95% confidence intervals. Um, so basically, that's what we're defining as the normal range of variation in the salt marsh sparrow population. And then we can take one of those and we can hit it with a hurricane and see if it bounces it outside of that normal range of variation. Um, and we, we did this many, many times um, across the entire range of potential demographic impacts from one sparrow dying to all but one sparrow dying. Um, so it was a pretty big just simulation project, and what we found was that salt marsh sparrows are, are, and other salt marsh birds, although I'm only going to talk about the sparrows today, are pretty robust to the, in the face of these disturbances. So this graph just shows the proportion of simulated populations that got bounced out of their normal range of variation after being hit with a hurricane that varies from 0% reduction in survival to 100% reduction in survival. So even if you killed half of the salt marsh sparrows with a hurricane, only about half of the population trajectories would be impacted enough to bounce out um, of those bounds. And in the long term, a lot of them will return eventually. Um, and so this is just um, showing that a large proportion of these population trajectories will return to the normal range of variation, even after disturbances that we really haven't witnessed um, and are very unlikely to see while salt marsh sparrows are still alive. So that's potentially some good news for salt marsh sparrows. And it's also good news for modelers because I don't think this is a really high priority to assimilate into modeling. Um, but there is another assumption that is probably more important, which is that the nesting habitat doesn't change. Salt marsh sparrows nest in tidal marsh grasses. And um, so they nest in these high elevation areas, relatively high elevation, that flood twice a month rather than twice a day. Um, so they, they nest primarily in Juncus gerardii and Spartana patens. And with sea level rise, it's expected that 
these higher, higher elevation species are going to be overtaken by these lower elevation species. And so potentially salt marsh sparrows are losing their nesting habitat. But this is a, a much bigger um, issue than just salt marsh sparrows because these three species are the ecosystem engineers of tidal marshes. And so if we're seeing a big pattern in shifts of occurrence in these species, it's signaling a pretty big change to tidal marshes in general. There's not a lot of information uh, out there about what's happening to these, these species. There's some isolated studies that suggest that, in fact, sea level rise is causing high elevation marsh plants to be overtaken by low elevation marsh plants. Uh, we had an opportunity to kind of extend these studies, um, the geographic scope of these studies, because we've been studying salt marsh sparrows since 2002 and studying where they nest, and so we have a lot of vegetation data. And we were able to resurvey these, those vegetation data across 55 plots um, across 12 marsh complexes, which is really extending how much um, information we have on, on plant distribution shifts. So in 2002, they did a bunch of plant surveys. We did them exactly the same way in 2013, which is just an 11 year difference. Um, but now we have two data, two data points to compare against. So the graphs I'm going to show coming up have, all have this format. And so basically the black bar is a 95% credible or posterior prediction interval, and the white is the posterior mean. So what we found through doing this resurvey is that even just over 11 years, we saw a pretty big shift away from areas that were dominated by Juncus gerardii, which is the least flood tolerant plant, um, to areas that were being overtaken by Spartina alterniflora, which is the most flood tolerant plant. And all of these shifts were actually associated, so any gains in Spartina alterniflora were correlated with declines in Juncus gerardii. So, and this was, each one of these bars is a marsh complex. This was a pattern that we found everywhere we looked. Um, so basically, we see a very consistent signal of losing high elevation marsh plants and salt marsh sparrow habitat. Um, and uh, we don't have this directly caused by sea level rise because we didn't collect sea level rise data, um, but we, don't, we can't think of many other causes that would cause such a consistent trend over such a short period of time. Um, and there, there are some long-term tidal cycles that happen over decades, um, but it, currently that tidal cycle is going in the opposite direction you would expect for this to be happening. So that's potentially very bad news for salt marsh sparrows, because on top of this threat from tidal flooding, um, not having this complexity built into the model is actually giving a more optimistic view than we probably should be taking. But there's hope. Um, so we see that tidal marshes are being squeezed, essentially, against the upland. But what if they're migrating inland, um, which would potentially open up lots of new areas? Um, in most areas in East North America, their topography suggests this should be possible. And one of the main ways we know this is through the sea levels affecting marshes model, which is a biophysical model of marsh migration landward. And because of this potential for marsh migration, uh, people are starting to maybe suggest that we're overestimating how vulnerable marshes are because we have this escape route. And maybe there's even more habitat to be opened up if marshes can move landward. In many places where this would happen, um, the process is uh, tidal inundation would kill a coastal forest, so the trees die, and that releases the salt marsh plants from competition. They were previously being shaded out. And they move into the upland and it becomes tidal marsh. And when that happens, you get this thing called a ghost forest. Um, so it's just a bunch of dead snags. But there is tidal marsh there. Um, and so there's lots of evidence that this happens. This is from New Jersey here. Um, this is a really good example of forest retreat over the last century. Even in Long Island Sound, you see this little ghost forest here. Um, so this is marsh that's moved into what was previously coastal forest. And there's a lot of planning going around the assumption that marshes are going to migrate landward. Um, so I, this is potentially pretty good news for salt marsh sparrows, you might think. Um, but the story's a little bit more complicated than that because um, this picture is one that I took that they used for this report. It's not a particularly good picture, but the only reason they use it is because this is the only example we have. Um, and so there's potentially this issue where we see ghost forests, and we think marsh migration must be happening. But without the broader spatial context, it's hard to know how often marsh migration is actually happening. And is it going to happen on scales that are going to save salt marsh sparrows and other tidal marsh birds? So to answer that question, 
We set up a systematic survey in Long Island Sound um, where in the marsh migration zone, anywhere we, we would expect marsh to happen based on topography, we set up these transects where we're looking at lots of different aspects of vegetation structure and bird community composition. This is just a zoomed in look at it. These, are, these transects were chosen completely randomly without respect to land ownership, so they're on a range of land ownerships, and we think they're pretty representative of coastal forest in Long Island Sound. I don't have time to talk about all of the, the results from this, but I'm gonna talk about the two biggest indicators of marsh migration, which is canopy dieback, and for the time scale we're thinking canopy dieback over the last 30 to 40 years, and then recent tree mortality at the marsh edge, which is a more recent phenomenon, maybe about 10 years or so. So t starting with tree canopy dieback, we took a bunch of random plots at the edge of the forest to marsh boundary, and we took aerial photos at three time steps at each one of these randomly selected plots, and we measured the amount of canopy in each of these time steps. Actually, we measured them 100 times each to propagate measurement error, so I think this is, we're trying to do as much as we can to detect very small changes, if there are very small changes to find. But what we found was, um, sure, there are areas that um, have experienced forest canopy dieback, so any bar that's below this zero line here has experienced forest canopy dieback. But there are just as many examples where the canopy is growing. And so if you take this complete picture and you find the statewide uh, or Long Island-wide uh, trend, you end up with a positive trend, because this is southern New England, the trees are growing um, after deforestation. But we aren't seeing any evidence that marsh migration is happening on a time scale that matters, or on a, a spatial scale that matters yet. But that doesn't tell us what's happening under the canopy, which is also a potentially interesting question. Um, so if we look under the canopy, we actually see a pretty similar story. So this graph just shows the proportion of trees that are recently dead, or sorry, um, the proportion of trees that are still alive, and a transect from the marsh edge to deeper in the forest. Um, for the average size class in our study area, there's really no evidence that there's more dead trees at the edge. For larger size classes, we didn't see any mortality at all. And we surveyed a lot of trees, uh, many thousands of trees. So we've looked at two scales here, and we still can't find any evidence that this process that is supposed to save tidal marshes from sea level rise is even starting to happen in Long Island Sound. Um, and it, does, it also raises questions about whether or not we're kind of seeing some observation bias here where we're seeing what we want to see. But we wanted to try one last thing to see if there's what's the most sensitive test that we could come up with to test whether or not maybe trees are stressed a little bit from saltwater inundation, which is a precursor to a tree dying, which would be a precursor to marsh migration. So we took tree cores at the marsh edge. This picture here shows a tree that's completely surrounded by tidal marsh plants. And these tree cores allowed us to look at growth rates over time, so we can look over pretty big time scales, like 300 years in some cases, to see if growth is changing over time. But we can also compare trees that are directly at the forest edge to trees that are further back to see if being closer to the tidal marsh is stressing them. <coughs> what we found was um, the growth rates of trees that have tidal marsh plants within one meter of their base, which we're saying is an edge tree, are growing faster than trees that are further back in the forest. Um, not surprising, because trees need light, and there's lots of light there, but you would think that at some point we're gonna reach a trade-off between saltwater inundation and increased light at the forest edge. But we're not even close to that point yet, it would seem. So based on these growth rates uh, that we found, we can be reasonably confident based on other studies that these trees aren't gonna die for the next 10 to 20 years at least. So there's clearly a mismatch between the marshes, which seem to be, my, seem to be responding to sea level rise on 10 year timescales, to coastal forest, which seems to be doing okay in Long Island Sound. And just to remind you of this picture, this tree is growing faster than this tree even though it's surrounded by tidal marsh, which I think is pretty incredible. Of course, these trees are eventually gonna die back. They can't, they can't withstand sea level rise forever, but the real question is, will it happen in time for, to save salt marsh sparrows? <laughs>
and other tidal marsh birds. If it's going to take a century, I think there's going to be a lot of extinctions that happen before marsh migration happens. So as far as this assumption goes, we probably, it probably was reasonable to assume that marshes won't migrate inland. Um, but it is nice to know that now. Um, and, but there are things that can be done to make this process move a little faster, like getting rid of the trees at the marsh edge. Um, that would potentially let uh, marshes move inland. Marshes are ready to move inland. If you get rid of the trees, they'll, they'll move inland. Um, but it seems like there's potentially this competition that's going to uh, play a big role. So what I've talked about so far are kind of ecological forms of knowledge that, um, I mean, I think we've gone pretty far past your basic population viability analysis to this point to really understand extinction risk. Uh, but it's still all in the ecological realm. But marsh migration doesn't just depend on coastal forest because, as I alluded to earlier, a lot of eastern North America is very highly developed. In some areas, the marsh migration zone is owned by thousands of coastal landowners. And these landowners are making decisions about what to do on their properties in response to coastal flooding. And one of those decisions is building shoreline hardening. And so this is a, just an example of seawalls. If a coastal landowner builds a seawall, it's going to be very difficult for marsh to move onto that property. So we're really interested in understanding how many landowners are going to build seawalls and how many landowners are potentially interested in participating in a conservation agreement that would make it so that marshes could move landward. And conservation organizations um, in the Northeast especially are working with landowners to try to protect these corridors from marsh migration to give marshes some kind of chance. Unfortunately, we don't really know a lot about um, how people are going to respond to conservation strategies in the face of sea level rise. So this is a, a question that we've been interested in. How are the behavioral intentions of the coastal landowners who live in the marsh migration zone going to affect the effectiveness of conservation strategies for marsh migration? Uh, we did a mail survey to learn some more about coastal landowners. Um, I worked on this with Dr. Ashley Dayer at Virginia Tech, who's a social psychologist who studies, who studies the human dimensions of wildlife conservation. And we developed this survey to measure people's behavioral intentions, but also get a sense for what characteristics and factors would explain those behavioral intentions. And we sent this to 3,000 coastal landowners. Uh, we got about one third of them back, which was pretty good. And so the non-respondents are here, and the respondents are here, just to show you that it's a pretty good spatial representation of this population. We asked them about a range of conservation agreements um, that they might want to participate in that would allow marshes to migrate. And this graph is just going to show the proportion of respondents who would prefer this conservation agreement. So this is a conservation easement. They retain ownership of their land, but they're not allowed to build a wall, but they do get a tax incentive. Not many landowners want to do that. Um, this is an outright purchase, so they're going to sell their land to a conservation organization for fair market value. Again, not many people want to do that. Um, more people were interested in a restrictive covenant, which this does not involve a conservation organization. This is an agreement amongst themselves, so an agreement among landowners. And then finally, we have a future interest agreement, which is kind of an interesting one. It was the most popular one. And this basically says they'll sign an agreement with a conservation organization today that would say if your property is reduced, property value is reduced by 50% in the future by a storm, that property transfers to the conservation organization. Um, but the catch is the landowner gets today's fair market value. So it's kind of an insurance policy. Um, a little bit over 20% of landowners suggested that that would be their preferred option. Um, but can anyone guess what the, the, the most popular option was? <laughs> yeah, none. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps. Um, so overall, we have this pattern of pretty low intentions to participate in conservation actions that would be beneficial to marshes. But we're also interested in well, then what kind of attitudes and beliefs are predictors of behavioral intentions? Because these are potentially points of intervention. Um, conservation organizations are doing lots of outreach and environmental education in these areas to um, get landowners to make decisions about their properties that would benefit conservation. 
And if we can identify which types of attitudes and behavior, or beliefs are responsible for those behaviors, those could be good targets for environmental education. So we looked at um, three in particular, strengthening climate change beliefs, increasing the importance placed on marsh ecosystem services. So convincing people that the fact that marshes buffer their property from storm surge is a good thing. Um, and then membership in environmental groups. And we also looked at uh, a range of characteristics that might be correlated with these, just so we can make sure that we're isolating the thing that we're most interested in. Um, so for example, membership in environmental groups is probably uh, pretty strongly correlated with demographic characteristics. So we looked at a pretty broad range. I'm not gonna talk too much about these. I'm, I'm happy to talk um, about this broader project at, um, at any time. But we did find a few beliefs and attitudes and experiences that were predictive of behavioral intentions. Um, so this, I'm just gonna walk you through this figure here. Um, this first part just shows the belief, attitude, or experience that we were measuring. Um, so for example, how people responded to the statement, I will be offered an incentive to participate in a conservation agreement. And then the behavior that we're interested in. So um, we've looked at a range of different behaviors here. And then finally, how many times more likely um, having this attitude or belief made it so they would participate in that behavior? Um, so we, did, we found some interesting um, results. The two strongest effects we found were related to distrust of conservation organizations. So if you can alleviate people's concerns that they'll actually receive an incentive, and if you can alleviate their concerns that that incentive will be fair, you could potentially increase the prevalence of conservation easements in these areas. Um, the one I want to draw your attention to, which I thought was kind of interesting, is marsh wildlife is important. It's something that came up a bunch of times. Um, what you won't see here is any arguments about ecosystem services. Um, but landowners who had attitudes that marsh wildlife was important and that the fact that tidal marshes provide a home for wildlife was important um, consistently were correlated with behavioral intentions to participate in conservation easements and to not build shoreline protection. So we have a potential attitude here that has some power, that is something that conservation organizations are already working to change. Um, and so how that might work is you have an intervention that changes a belief or an attitude, and that ultimately leads to behavior change. And if everything works out, there's an on-the-ground change to the target. So this intervention where we're convincing lots of landowners that salt marsh sparrows are really cool um, will eventually lead to salt marsh sparrow populations doing better. That's the idea. Um, but there's a lot of points in this process where this can break down, obviously. Um, and there's not a lot of work that tries to connect all of these pieces in a, a holistic framework. And so that's one of the things I'm trying to work on at Sasink. Um, and, and so I'm gonna start presenting a model that I'm working on here um, with Julie that is trying to link these pieces to, to take these assumptions that we've been talking about and incorporate them into this big model of salt marsh sparrow population viability. The first component of this model is um, a human behavior model. I don't really have time to talk too much about that, but it's based in social psychology. It's also based on the reasoned action approach. If you're familiar with social psychology, it's just a model of behavior change. Um, and we're using our survey data to inform this model of behavior change. And then we're integrating this with an agent-based or individual-based model of landowner behavior. So we're modeling this at the parcel scale, individual parcel decisions. And we're gonna incorporate uh, models like SLAM to predict where marsh migration is gonna happen. We're ultimately gonna put this, this big bird population individual-based model that I presented earlier in here, which has a tide prediction component. Um, but now, since we have humans into the equation, we can link back flooding to human behavior, because one thing we do know is that when humans experience flooding, it changes their behavior. So this is a model that I'm currently working on. Um, I'm gonna show some preliminary results. This is just, if I can get it to work, um, just shows you how the model works. No. Activate, oh well. Um, so basically, we're modeling whether or not that landowner built shoreline protection based on a lot of different factors. Um, and then that feeds right into the availability of marsh migration, which feeds into our model of population viability for salt marsh sparrows. So we are finally at a place 
where we're starting to incorporate these assumptions into the modeling explicitly. So instead of saying salt marsh sparrows will go extinct in 2050 unless we can just say with greater confidence salt marsh sparrows are going to go extinct in 2050. And we can also start making the connections between the links between environmental education and conservation that I mentioned earlier. So I'm just going to show some preliminary work that we've been doing to try to uh, see how that might work. So the attitude here is that tidal marshes are important uh, for providing a home for wildlife. And in the population right now, this is how the people respond to that question. Uh, so this is the current distribution of attitudes. Lots of people think this is pretty important, but there are also many landowners who think that providing a home for wildlife is not important. And if we run this big model that has all these social and ecological factors in it to um, see how much land is going to be behind um, shoreline hardening or some kind of seawalls, you get this simulation over the, the next 20 years. So over time, more and more people start building seawalls and more and more area is, of the marsh migration zone is closed off to marsh migration. Ultimately, this will be, I want to change this y-axis to you know, salt marsh sparrow population size, but that's in progress. Um, but this is something, it's a start. Um, so now we can look at, well, what if we were able to change? What about the best case scenario that we can think of? What if we're able to change everyone in the population's mind about um, tidal marshes being important? So anyone would answer this question saying that tidal marshes providing a home for wildlife is very important to me. Then we can run this model again to see how that changes the number of landowners that have um, built shoreline protection. Um, and this, this shows this in the red line here. So there's less area behind shoreline hardening that can't be marsh, but it's not a lot less, especially when you consider the uncertainty of these models, because we we're, again, propagating lots of forms of uncertainty. So even though it seemed like this could be a really promising thing, um, when you really scale it up to a scale that matters for conservation, it looks like even some of the strongest effects we found that would be some of the best targets um, for conservation maybe don't have as much power as you might hope. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in taking this a little bit further. Um, there's some aspects that I've kind of glossed over today, like the importance of marsh elevation. Um, we're certainly modeling marsh elevation in here, but as you can imagine, marsh elevation offsets sea level rise. But in general, we're just talking a matter of millimeters here that makes all the difference. And so the more sophisticated understanding of marsh elevation we have, the better. Um, that's one of the things that I'm really excited about working on over the next year um, with the Lockwood Lab is, is building in more sophisticated understanding of marsh elevation change. But I do think that what we've done so far has been worth it because um, it is changing our understanding of salt marsh sparrow population viability. So this is a paper I published earlier this year that is just a basic ecology model of when salt marsh sparrows will go extinct, which has them in the later half of the century. But once we start building in all of these hydrological factors like tides, ecological factors like um, the potential for marshes to have a lag for migration, the fact that um, marshes seem to be drowning already, it really changes our understanding and puts extinction further um, into the century to the point where maybe we're running out of time to do anything about it at all. So on that note, we are looking at different ways to change people's attitudes towards marshes as um, a potential solution, um, I'm not going to talk about this too much, but this is uh, some work that we've done that's fairly traditional, looking at basic um, education messages that were already being used. So a lot of environmental organizations were using flyers to educate people about tidal marshes. And so we took a lot of the information from their flyers and we put them in our own flyers and then we tested them on this population to see if um, Receiving this flyer and learning about tidal marshes would change their attitudes. And I'm just going to summarize all this by saying it doesn't. Um, but since we're also running out of time, I wanted to end by talking about something a little crazy, um, about ways that we might change people's minds, um, something that might be more effective than just handing them a flyer with some facts on it, because there's so much evidence from social science coming out now that you can't just tell people facts and change their minds. You have to play to their emotions and you have to engage them repeatedly in a story. Um, so instead of these flyers, we've been considering the option of a coloring book um, that tells the story of salt marsh sparrows um, 
in a way that would get people to learn about the story, um, but also engage with it repeatedly. Um, and, and, and is very emotionally manipulative as well. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna go through the entire thing, um, but you know, there are like, this is just an example where it's um, a story along with things that people can color. So that says, so the eggs have hatched and the chicks are old enough to climb to safety. Not everyone makes it. Um, and that's one of the happier slides, I think. Um, <laughs> But that's just something that, like, looking to the future, this is not part of succinct work because I'm, I'm really focused on synthesizing existing information. But with an eye toward, you know, since we're running out of time, let's, let's, let's throw some crazy ideas out there um, to see if we can do something over the next 20 years um, to potentially prevent extinction of salt marsh sparrows and all of, the, all of the tidal marsh endemic vertebrates that are gonna come after them. So with that, I will take questions. Well, here, I think. Um, so there's, the topography is better for marsh migration in the Mid-Atlantic than it is in the Northeast. Um, but there is still potential in the Northeast for marsh migration to happen, and it's still not happening. So I just want, I'd like to clarify that topography isn't the only explanation for the regional differences. Um, there's community composition differences, mostly softwoods down here as opposed to hardwoods up north. I don't know if that has something to do with it. Um, but yeah, the, the it seems like there's more marsh migration down here um, happening. Um, ghost forests are more apparent. Um, it's being studied a lot more down here. Although I still do caution against making assumptions from looking at where we study marshes and saying that that's representative of the coastline. Because we tend to study areas that we've studied for a long time or we go to study marsh migration where marsh migration is happening, which doesn't necessarily tell us um, how much is marsh migration happening. I think that it seems like we maybe we're tending towards overestimating how common this phenomenon really is. Although I don't doubt that it is happening already. Do you think it's in part a question of people have the lapse that it just, it, it could happen eventually, but there just hasn't been enough of a... I think so. I think that's the most interesting part of it. From an ecological perspective, you have trees which are like a persistence niche species that don't want to go anywhere and have lived for centuries and tidal marsh grasses which can't compete with anything. Um, so it creates this lag. Um, that I think, I don't think ecology is the only thing that matters here, but I think ecology is kind of an overlooked aspect of what could hold back marsh migration just long enough to be an important ecological phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah, my question is kind of similar. For the growth rate, you looked specifically at oaks, I think? We, so I should have said, we looked at a range of species. Oh, okay. um, we looked at oaks are the dominant species. We looked at red maples, which are a mid-dominant species, um, also seem to be more salt tolerant. And we looked at Nyssa sylvatica, because they live forever. Um, and we found the same pattern for all of them. <coughs> yeah, that's what I was going to add. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and Nyssa is really interesting in particular because we have some trees that are um, some of the oldest trees in New England, uh, because their wood is so hard that they couldn't, that when they were colonizing, they couldn't cut them down. Um, and so they've seen a lot of sea level rise change, sea level change, over their lifetimes and they're still there. Yeah. Given that the upper federal estate is the management of those forests of an option, potential option, cutting out trees? Yeah, and they're doing some experimental cutting already um, on federal refuges where they're cutting cutting the upland to see I mean, we're pretty sure that marsh is going to move in, but then see what that marsh looks like when it moves in, because no one really knows. Um, that's the other ecological component to this. Does it become high elevation marsh, or does it just become flooded marsh? Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was also wondering about that. Um, so do you know, do you have any sort of you know, number idea of how, how much more quickly marsh migration might happen 
inland if the trees are removed versus if they're not? No, I mean, we, we do have some plots set up to measure that, but we haven't measured it yet. It's, they're established and the process is happening, but we haven't resurveyed it. Um, but marshes, I mean, they can move pretty much immediately. We do see marshes moving onto people's lawns. If people don't build walls, they start mowing marsh grass. Um, so I don't think that that's really a problem. Um, they're they're uh, pretty fast moving. It's, I think it's just topography and trees and other, other biophysical factors that we haven't learned about yet. Uh, so I also have another question. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you were focusing on the salt marsh there in particular, but you know, um, how much are other species like the seaside sparrow or rail or whatever other birds that nest um, in that sort of that habitat, how much are they being affected in contrast or are they more resilient? I don't think we have any evidence that any of them are resilient to changing where they nest. Okay. Um, but they all nest in slightly different areas. So it's, I think it's probably salt marsh sparrows and then maybe clapper rails are a little bit worse off. Um, not that salt marsh sparrows are worse off. Salt marsh, uh, clapper rails are a little bit better than maybe seaside sparrow and maybe willet. But ultimately, there are, I mean, if sea levels rise enough and we lose high marsh, if we lose high marsh, there's no more vertebrates probably because they need to breathe air. <laughs> and low marsh floods twice a day, um, so that's a problem. Um, but uh, we have some extent, we're working on extinction estimates for the other species to, to be more explicit than just take my word for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert in how that would happen, um, but one thing I do know is that recreating high marsh, high elevation marsh with those plants is very difficult because um, it's a very small elevation range you're shooting for and it's really all about the inundation hours, which is really hard to replicate. Um, there, are, there is some work from University of New Hampshire happening right now where they're building floating marshes. Um, so if they can get these marsh plants to grow on peat, um, where there are no competitors because it's a barge, um, then if a sparrow nested on that, that'd be pretty good. Um, but I, I don't believe they've ever had anything take to one of those. And it's very cost, costly. Um, every, anything that happens with salt marsh sparrows from this point forward is very costly. The other option is pulling them out of their nests at high tides and then putting them back in. Um, so. I mean, it's, it's, it, that's a, a question of like conservation trade-offs, whether or not that's a good use of resources. Any other questions? Okay, so thank, thank you. you